you. Hello, everyone. I am so excited to have you here today. Um, we have an excellent presenter, Dr. Fran Tugas with KMC University, and I have been so excited about this presentation for months. Um, so many of our providers have been hit with tornadoes, um, with hurricanes in the last couple of years, flooding, and all of these things have such a huge impact on your practice. So I'm so excited that we have somebody who really knows what she is talking about to tell you how to prepare for this, you know, for one of these disasters. Uh, Dr. Fran retired in 2017 after 28 years in practice in Vermont, joined the KMC University team in the fall of 2017, and has been working as part of their education department analysis service ever since. In her spare time, she is an active MRC Medical Reserve Corps member and a volunteer for the American Red Cross, specializing in disaster relief services. She volunteers as a Tai Chi instructor at AgeWell, a local area agency on aging organization. Dr. Fran is also a certified professional medical auditor, a well-known lecturer, and a health and wellness enthusiast. And might I add, she is funky and fun, too, and you know that's really what I look for when I'm trying to find presenters. they got to be fun. they got to be interesting interesting topics that are beneficial to you. And I'm going to tell you what, she she gets a check in every box. So, Dr. Fran, thank you so much for being here today. Well, thank you. Jeez, you, you, you made me tired just listening to all that. <laughs> um, well, <laughs> I'm doing this because it. we've had so many disasters, especially this year, and I got to thinking with my knowledge that I really wanted to just help the the provider out there at least get their facility uh, and their office prepared for some disaster, what we call, um, you know, code code nine uh, code not nine code thirty three as as emergency. So we're going to overall overall look at some of the preparedness that you can do. Um, and the main thing is just to start getting prepared. So we'll look at some FEMA stuff. We'll look at uh, uh, Red Cross and some Safety Council information. So we've seen all of this happening Depending on where you are, I know in Vermont, uh, we get lots of snow. Uh, we're getting hurricanes again. Uh, Florida's bracing, unfortunately, for Michael. Uh, earthquakes, floods, all of this. And we seem to be having so many more of these disasters. And, you know, the bottom line is we have to have a plan. You have to have a plan. And this also goes for your, for your home. You know, what we say here about your office or facility, do it for your home, too, um, because we, we need a plan. Um, some of these we know about ahead of time, somewhat of a hurricane, earthquakes, not so much, flooding, not so much, or, or tornadoes, definitely not. Um, so, so if we have a plan in effect, it will make things run so much easier. It's, uh, it's not easy to to see which is uh, going to be down the road. According to the National Center for Disaster Preparedness at Columbia University, back in uh, 2015, two-thirds of Americans were not prepared to evacuate at all in an emergency. Um, these are the recent ones this year in Hawaii with the volcano and the car fire in California. And FEMA administrator says that overall, America lacks is a lacks the culture of preparedness. And so the main thing today is, is at least to get started. You can't do anything till you get started. And we look at the whole picture and it makes it so difficult sometimes, but it really isn't. And we're gonna look at some of the ways that we can help with your office. This came out of uh, USA, and sorry, it's a little blurry there, but basically 60% of households don't have any type of emergency plan in place, and I could bet that a majority of you don't have something planned for your office, um, so we need to change that. That's, that's really important. When we look at public health and safety, um, there are three goals that we want to um, – to look at and we want to establish consistency a lot of these are requirements if you're a health care provider uh, in Medicare or Medicaid we want to increase public safety during emergencies and we want to 
establish more coordinated responses to natural and man-made, man-made disasters. And this is happening a lot because we're having a lot of, of these uh, disasters happening. Um, back in, uh, well, let's, nope, I slipped, uh, I, I missed a slide there, that's okay. Let's talk about what preparedness is. According to CMS, the Centers for Medicare Services, it includes developing a plan. Here we go, this is what I've been talking about. How a provider is gonna meet the needs of your patients if essential services were breaking down as a, as a result of a disaster or a hurricane hit your area earthquake, whatever it may be. So we need to review the basic information of your office or facility. We need to look at some hazards and analyze that. And then we need to provide some type of care and services during that emergency. So that also means training yourself and training your staff um, and later on testing the plan and revising it if we need to. So it's it's basically a four part uh, series that we're gonna look at. CMS says that emergency plan purpose is to establish a preparedness requirement to ensure planning for both natural and man-made disasters, but we need to coordinate this with our federal and state, tribal, local uh, teams um, that uh, that we work with. Many of the, the preparedness rules that we're going to look at um, they require t- the 17 providers and suppliers to have some type of emergency plan. Um, Mostly it deals with uh, bigger clinics and rehabs, but it just makes good business sense for us as chiropractors to have it in our office. Um, The overall compliance in the emergency preparedness basically regulates to participation in Medicare and Medicaid. Back in uh, at uh, Hurricane Harvey last year, the secretary of uh, HHS uh, basically said that they were allowed to put a halt um, to share disaster um, on the privacy rule, which basically allowed um, information to be shared in amongst disaster relief efforts to assist the patients in receiving care. Now. Don't know if this is going to happen with the current uh, Alex Azar, I believe is the new uh, HHS secretary this year, Um, but they have the right to do that, and it only applies during a public health emergency declaration, Um, mostly to hospitals, um, but basically the privacy rule would be waived if... uh, they decided to do that, and they may do that with uh, with Michael coming up because it looks like it's going to be pretty good size. So we wouldn't have to worry so much about distributing privacy notices or, or privacy restrictions um, if that happens. And it's only usually it's about a 72 hours. Sometimes it's a little bit more, but something to know about that uh, that uh, may come down the pike. The emergency preparedness rule that I mentioned um, was published a couple of years ago, back in September of 16. Um, And like I said earlier, it was basically for those of us who are Medicare and Medicaid uh, participating providers. Um, And then it implemented a year ago, uh, November of of 17. And it's, it's a little difficult when you look at this rule because it talks about 17 providers. It doesn't specifically say chiropractors, but it talks about clinics and rehab centers. And many of you do have uh, uh, multidisciplinary uh, clinics or rehab centers. Um, And like I said earlier, it's just a good, uh, a good business practice to do that and we're going to look at four actions um, that we can take and that'll be our next slide here there's basically four actions that we can take to min- minimize the impact of these emergencies and these natural disasters on your operations and your overall financial health uh, uh, of your office so we're going to look at some basic risk assessment and planning that's our first thing We'll look at some policies and procedures that you need to implement in your in your clinic or office. Communication plan, 
across the board? How, how are we going to communicate this amongst others? And then we're going to train and test the program. Um, so those are the, this is right from CMS. Um, and I have uh, references for, for all you folks who want all this uh, at the end um, and links to all that uh, Chrissy can provide too. Um, the first one is the risk assessment, and that's probably the, the biggest thing, is to develop some type of plan. So wherever you are, if you're in Mississippi, if you're in Vermont where I am, if you're in California, what are the, the disasters that are specific to your location? You know, um, if you're in Florida, obviously, or, or any of the, that southwest or southeast coast, um, you need to obviously deal with hurricanes, flooding, um, what's going to happen uh, to your equipment, what happens during any power failures, um, even cyber attacks, what happens if you lose a portion or all of your facility. It could be someone driving into your building for that matter. Um, and then obviously it could interrupt uh, your normal essentials of uh, water and food or whatever. But the main thing is looking, you know, sit down with your team and, and, and work together um, to to find out what could happen in this area, what has happened in this area. And that process um, provides a cooperation and collaboration, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, with if you can work with some of the local or regional uh, officials, and that will help to ensure an overall integrated response down the road. So this is probably number one. I can't do anything without finding out what I need to do first. Um, once I have that, once I have that plan, um, I need to put in some policies and procedures that need to be addressed on a, a, on a myriad of, of issues. Evacuation plans. What if I need to shelter in place? And we'll talk about that in a few minutes. What if, uh, where are my patients and staff during an emergency? Um, you might want to use some volunteers um, and train them in, in advance, depending on the size of your clinic. And all of these policies and procedures, like most anything that's federal, needs to be updated at least annually and, and revised uh, as much as your any of your compliance programs uh, need to be looked at. So let's look on to some uh, little f more fun slides, I should say. So we, we, there's a couple of things that we need to do, and the difference is knowing the difference between evacuation and sheltering in place. If, for example, you lived in Alabama, they're notorious for tornadoes, and you may have not, not much warning about that. Shelter in place means actually just that. You stay where you are. You find an interior room within your facility, maybe you have a large rehab room away from windows, and you stay there. So it would be nice to have maybe some food or supplies or something there because you don't know how long. It may be a few hours. It could be a day. You, you really don't know how long that is. Um, evacuation is just that. You may need to immediately or an urgent move um, away from some threat. You were in the car fire in, in California and you needed to move out of there. How do I get out? What's my transportation? Um, where are my evacuation routes? We should have this at home too. Where are we going to meet? Are we going to meet at a particular location? Is it going to be a park? Is it, you know, those are the kind of things that you would start putting in with your risk assessment and your policy and procedures. Geez, we need an evacuation plan in case something happens or and or we need to know what sheltering in place is. And the main thing here, too, is everyone needs to be trained just as much as you're training your staff on HIPAA and uh, other aspects of your practice, they need to know what's going on, who's going to be called. And uh, we'll look at some of these right now. Now, one of the, the, uh, the third step in, in this four-step risk assessment is a communication plan. And basically, we want and what you would want in your facility, in, in your office, is start getting names and contacts of area officials, um, your emergencies, maybe hospitals, um, uh, 
you know, in in my town, I I had numbers of everybody there, the fire chief, the, all of these people in case that you need them. Um, what if something happened to your facility? You might want to make arrangements with other providers um, that may need to receive your, your patients over a period of time in case that you can't operate anymore. Your office has been uh, devastated by flooding. Um, and how are you going to share medical records? records and patient information amongst that. So that's a communication plan. How are we going to work amongst each other and, and get that going? There may be another chiropractor in town. Um, I had a dentist two doors down. I had a youth coalition. So we got together and, and, and put together a communication plan, and that was locally. Um, uh, Medical Reserve Corps, all of those that you um, can get together and put that now, the last one, and probably the most important, is the training and testing. Now, CMS says that we're supposed to do two testings annually. One should be community-based, a full-scale, and an additional one. Now, this can be changed a bit, um, but basically, we want to, to develop this training and testing, um, especially your initial training, so that you know that it's going to work. Um, what is my plan? Where are my emergency procedures? Has everybody been been informed of this? And are we going to we're going to conduct some drills and exercises to to actually test this emergency? So if you have a smaller facility, maybe you only have one other staff, you may not need to do a full community based exercise. You may need just to do three or four things because the regulation allows for some flexibility in the training and testing. Um, you may, how do I make the phone calls? Where's my, my phone, my phone log, my phone tree, if I want to call it. Um, if I need to move people, mass notification, where are people going to go again? Where is our evacuation plan? Um, and then what are what specifically are your staff going to do? Maybe someone is, is, uh, in charge of making the phone calls. Someone else is in charge of moving people into a particular room. Um, so that would be a much smaller scale, but it's still a training and testing program just in case. Just like you had the fire drills when you were in school, and I teach at a local community college, we have fire drills, we have active shooter responses, and we go through these. We should be doing that in our offices and our facilities and, and at home too. A full scale would be getting together with other community members, kind of like a mock drill, if you want to say it. Um, so you might have other providers, you might have other uh, emergency response, maybe of the local EMS in town, um, and you would actually simulate this. Um, my office was behind a high school, and every year they simulated a crash for the students. Um, and some of us were involved in that um, so that they could see what would happen in, in, in a car accident and the emergency response. So you might, in your, in your communication plan, do something like an exercise scenario. So here's one. Severe storms have been plaguing your area for the past few days. 12 hours ago, this severe storm uh, system produced some strong tornadoes. Um, the damage is widespread. It's impacting the communities and the health care. And the county emergency operations center has been activated and shelters have been opened and the community. The Red Cross would most likely be involved in that too. So if you were in your office, what would you do? You know, these are all scenarios that we need to look at. So when we look at the testing and training program, here's an actual one that I was involved in at one point. Um, maybe you have some clinics in your area. We had a, a local medical uh, uh, facility, um, the Medical Reserve Corps, um, obviously your law enforcement, fire departments, any sister facilities, any other, um, your podiatrist, your dentist, any other vendors, uh, the youth coalition. Um, we also worked with the family center um, that was in town and we actually drew up a couple of these and would do these yearly at different, um, different times. And it came into 
I, the intervention is this. It, it's it's not only to to assess the feasibility, but it provides that emergency plan through the testing, and it and it encourages you to be involved in the community and to promote a more coordinated response with these other facilities, um, local and public health and, and emergency systems. So it works really well with that. Um, and lastly, as we used to call it in the Red Cross, um, I was down in Irma last year for a couple weeks. Um, we call this a hot wash. What happens after? All right. After we do this testing and training, um, we want to look at our objectives. You know, was our was our scenario correct? Um, what were activities that we actually did? Who participated? Not only your staff, but it was other local members. What were the strengths and then what were the areas of improvement? What should we have done? Oh, you know, we didn't have a second exit or we didn't have this. And what do we need to do in the future? With that, then you can you can task someone, it could be your office manager, it could be someone else, um, to actually capture those particular actions and tasks that were completed. Were they done com were they done? correctly? Was the mass call out done? Um, who did the task? So this is another evaluation that what do we need to do to make it better? There's always something that can be that can be done better. And basically, when you look at this chart, it just is all everything that we need to do, create it, test it, uh, emphasize communications. Maybe your employees can work remotely down the road, but these are all some important items that we need to look at um, when we create this, this plan for, for any type of disaster. Now I'm going to look at a couple of specific things that we don't realize that we need to have in our office. Um, OSHA. OSHA is the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, was formed back in 1971 by President Nixon, just for those of you who needed to know that information. Um, and believe it or not, employers are responsible for the safety and health of its workers and, and to provide a safe and healthful workplace. And we're also required to protect our workers from any type of anticipated hazards. One of the things that we need to do, and most of us don't have in our office, is we need to have exit routes. And they need to be in every treatment room, and they should be in your waiting room or your reception room. Um, you see these in a lot of offices and a lot of diff different places, but this is part of a public building per se that we must, we must have. They need to be clearly marked. They should be lit. The, the route should be wide enough to accommodate uh, any personnel that's evacuating, should be a minimal three feet wide. Um, definitely, uh, um, not obstructed by anything, no, no cards, no, you know, copies of papers or any of those kind of things. Um, and any hazards, well, we're mo most likely not going to have hazards um, and hazardous materials in our office, but any of that should, should be uh, removed. Next, we need to actually have exit signs um, in our office. They need to be permanent. That is a key OSHA thing. Um, good idea to have fire extinguishers. They should be tested every year. Every year I would have my, my fire extinguisher guy come in and check my fire extinguishers. Smoke alarms and carbon monoxide detectors. Again, tested annually. Um, if you have any type of chemicals, um, if you're still using an old developer, any of that kind of stuff, you would want an eye wash station, definitely a first aid kit. And in some of the larger uh, facilities, you may even want an AED, an automated external defibrillator. So these are just some other safety issues that you might want to uh, um, come about with this. One of the, the, the next things that I find is so important is to be trained in CPR. Whether you get it, uh, again, your local fire department can do it. The Red Cross has plenty of classes. The American Heart Association also does. Um, but 
back uh, uh, 10,000, this was just done recently by the Heart Association, 10,000 cardiac arrest situations occur in a workplace each year. I had a couple of uh, um, MIs in my office uh, um, over the years, and only 45% of employees were actually trained, um, and only 50% of those even knew how to use an AED or where it was even located. This is so important. I can't stress this. Um, that CPR, if it was provided immediately after some type of cardiac arrest, um, increases the victim's chance of survival by double or triple. And we've all heard stories about that. But, you know, if you're not CPR certified, get yourself and your staff CPR certified. It's it's one of the best things. I've had to use it once. I've had to use the Heimlich maneuver a couple of times. Um, and you just the more you know, um, you're just there to, to um, help that person, that patient. Um, I could be a staff worker for that, for that matter. So we'll look at a few things. This was the earthquake back in uh, October of 89. I was out there. I was taking, uh, uh, ready to take my boards, um, and um, this was scary. Um, ironically, the day before, we were taking an Irene Gold review class, and there was a firefighter that was in there, and during one of our breaks, he told us what to do to always look at where fire escapes are and fire exits are um, in in public buildings, and I always did from then on, and the next day, the earthquake hit, and of course, we always remember drop cover and hold on. Well, we were in the basement, and this was a 7.1 on the Richter scale, so this was a really big earthquake, and um, I got under cover, but within, I think it was 30 seconds, we were like, we need to get out. We need to get out. Um, and thank God we did because um, we ended up staying um, on the floor of that uh, hotel um, in San Jose. And uh, there was a lot of damage done. Bay Bridge collapsed here. These are, uh, this is a street out in San Francisco. The Cypress collapse here was uh, in Oakland. Uh, I live not too far from that. And we watched uh, a lot of emergency uh, responders um, help people get, you know, get out, untrapped out of there. And I think that started me thinking about, wow, I really need to know more about this. Um, and it really opened my eyes to, to, to that. Um, we see this a lot. Uh, tornadoes. How many of you live in a tornado area? What would you do if this is what your office looked like after a tornado hit, obviously you can't go back to work. So we're going to talk about some different preparedness that we can do. One of the best things you can do, and it's hard to see this, and I have this on some slides, uh, not some slides, some uh, references later on, but basically forming a kit. Um, in this particular case, this is a tornado kit, uh, but there's different other kits, first aid supplies, um, you know, maybe an emergency uh, radio, flashlights, batteries, uh, tents, tarps, all this kind of stuff. Some of these you can have in your office that are really easy to have. Um, some of these, uh, you know, whistles, um, um, having some extra cash on hand, obviously. Um, these are just smart things to do. Uh, most likely, yes, you're going to get, you know, most, most of these tornadoes in the Midwest, but you may have to shelter in place. You never know. So if you had some of these items, um, it just makes it easy, and you can it can go right there. Um, this is another thing that we're seeing so much of: um, active sh shooter. Um, uh, the local school in the area just did uh, a big training, see something, say something. And I think that is so important. And um, because of that, um, in southern Vermont here earlier this year, uh, they were able to get a hold of a young man that was in the process of, of uh, becoming an active shooter because some young uh, friend or uh, classmate uh, said something, and that really um, was so smart. The Me Medical Reserve Corps that I'm part of um, has teamed with uh, local EMS and police, and we've delivered these run, hide, fight programs um, to educate people and to stop the bleed. And what this basically is, like 
ducking under and covering for the earthquake. This is if you see something, if you can run, run. Get out of harm's way. If not, your next step would be to hide. And lastly, to fight. Let's hope that someone doesn't ever have to come to that. The Stop the Bleed program is basically first aid skills and um, the use of tourniquets. Um, we saw that in the Boston Marathon um, that uh, turn, those that applied tourniquets really saved the lives of, of some people. So this is something we don't think about, but you never know. You might have a disgruntled uh, uh, employee's husband or uh, – you know, we had this happen uh, um, in one of our um, classrooms uh, at the community college that I that I taught, where there was a um, for an ex that was uh, came and uh, was going to was quite physical. He didn't have a gun, but it was it was good to learn all of these things. All right, the next is obviously fire. We see that so much and we don't normally think about it. Fire is fast. It's hot. It's dark. It's deadly. And you know what? Burns aren't the number one cause uh, with fires. It is actually asphyxiation. That's the number one cause of fire death. And again, if you have an emergency plan and emergency evacuation in your facility, your office, your home, you can get out. If you can turn off utilities, that would be great. Again, carbon monoxide and smoke detectors are important. Um, the, your fire escape plan, you should at least always have two ways to get out. If you're on a second story, you might have a collapsible ladder. Um, I have one in my bedroom uh, at home. Um, and it's right accessible in case I need to get out on the second floor. These are all things that you don't think about, but you know where they are. Practice with your kids at home doing some of this and definitely practice with your staff. How do I get out if, if a fire suddenly started? The next is just just some the flooding. The flooding is just, we're seeing that already across the Carolinas. Um, these are, again, some... Um, Safety checks, know, uh, know the difference between a flash flood and um, a flood warning. Um, know you can sign up for Red Cross alerts. Um, and again, these are, and it may be difficult for you to see because they're kind of small, but these are some um, uh, disaster preparedness that you may need to have. And again, it was similar to the other ones. Um, you know, your documents may be bought. I will, I'll, we'll talk about that in a, in a minute. Your cell phone, chargers, family contacts, water, food, all of that kind of um, stuff. And these are just very important. And again, you can imagine that there may be uh, some of the doctors that can't get back into their offices um, after a flood. This is so important. We call these in MRC, we call this go bags. I have a go bag in my car. It's a it's a large backpack, and I have uh, I don't have three days of water in it, but I do have uh, a portable radio, um, a crank radio, first aid kits, gloves, tape, all of this kind of stuff. You and and in my office, I actually had a plastic bin that with the the cover that snaps down, and I had some different things. I had one of those Leatherman tools, um, you know surgical mask, I had an, uh, a rain poncho, just some different things that I, you just need to have. And those of us that are um, travel a lot, you may need to have a, dis uh, a car disaster uh, kit, um, especially those of us that live in New England. Um, nice to have an, uh, um, a shovel, a small shovel, an ice scraper, um, sometimes even some cat litter so you could get some traction if you ever got stuck. Um, we've seen uh, some of this where people get stranded from a snowstorm on, on, on freeway or throughway. Um, so it's nice to have some of this, and it doesn't really take a lot of, of room. Some flares, some uh, um, reflective triangles, all of that kind of stuff, some, you know, emergency bars. Um, all of that is actually smaller than what you would have 
in your in your office or at your home. But again, these are some great things to have. Probably one of the best things you want to do is get some type of phone app um, on your on your phone. The Red Cross has a great one here. We'll tell you where uh, shelters are in case, again, you need to get to a shelter. You can't get to your home from your office. Um, the National Safety Council has an emergency response a reference guide. CDC has it. FEMA has a lot of that. I actually got an alert about a half an hour before we came on today from our local public works division um, saying they're going to conduct smoke test of the storm and sanitary sewer in the area um, on October 10th, which is tomorrow. And they went on to say what they're going to do, why they're doing it, if you see smoke um, coming out of the catch basins, you know, blah, blah, blah. But that's a good thing to know. And since everybody has cell phones now, um, this, uh, I can't tell you how valuable it is to have uh, an app on your phone. So again, that's a that's another great thing. You would put that in your policies and procedures. This is this is what we're doing. We're going to have a policy to have emergency apps. We're going to make sure that they're tested. You know, blah blah blah. How many of you have pets? Lots of you. I used to bring my retriever to the office. Um, do you have anything for them? Um, what are you going to do with your pets? Um, here's a disaster kit that's actually for pets. Um, do you have any contacts? Do you know where they're where they're going to stay or lodge them in case you needed to evacuate and you couldn't bring them? Um, so this is, you know, again, leashes, photos, um, feeding information, medications in case they need that. And you should have three to five days of food um, available just in case and I always had some extra things for for my dog um, at the office um, along with home um, just in case I did get stuck a couple times in Sandy and a couple of snowstorms over the years in the office and made sure that that was important next is probably one of the most important things here um, flood insurance Depending on where you are, some of you own your building, some of you may be renting, but this is so important. FEMA just put this out, $700 a year for your flood insurance policy. The average claim is $43,000. That's a big claim. But how many people don't have flood insurance? Oh, you were told not to. It is it is a separate policy. It is not included in your and your business insurance, and it is not included um, in your homeowners. And let me show you um, what we have here. So we'll talk about a few different kinds. I have the link here for the emergency financial first aid kit on everything that you should do. One of the main things is go around and take pictures in your in your home and in your office of you know everything, your computers, your your everything in your office. Walk around, take pictures. Um, and, and make sure that you have appropriate insurance for all of these hazards. So look at flood, look at other disaster related, hurricane or wherever you're, you're located there. Um, in your business policy, do you have liability? Do you have business interruption? That's very important. Flood insurance, you know, cybersecurity, terrorism, theft, all of that. Um, those are all things that we need to update. And it's, kind of, it's not something that you want to do all the time. Um, your backup system on your computer, this is a big, big plus. You definitely should have some type of cloud-based backup system so that even if you can't go back to your facility, you can access um, your patient records um, at any place on on somewhere else how is your workers compensation do you have your you do you have workers insurance um for you for your staff your malpractice how about disability how about auto and making sure if your staff takes um makes errands for you to the post office or wherever make sure that they may be covered in case that there may be some type of accident so look at these a lot of times you can get multi policy discounts and I know I'm not here to talk about insurance or whatever but let me tell you the insurance saved me in in numerous different times over over some claims um you know the bottom line is guys 
It's better safe than sorry. And to make sure that you look at this, this FEMA, and again, we have the link to this, this um, emergency financial first aid kit is, is fantastic. I really like it. The other thing that I think is so important is to make sure that everything, all your important documents are uploaded to the cloud. You know, you can use something like Dropbox, but there's many up there. So that's home and office. You know, they say to take your paperwork with you or whatever. Well, what if you, you can't or it's in the basement and it got flooded? I always scan and make copies of my, you know, my homeowners, all of my policies, my certificates, whatever it is. I scan everything and it's uploaded um, so that I always have a copy of that. And it doesn't take long, you know, a copy of your current, uh, your chiropractic license, whatever it may be. You can delegate this out to someone, um, but it doesn't take long. And once you do it, you get a, 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 a new uh, declaration every year, a new policy, you just upload the new one and delete the other one. So that's always important. This next slide is probably one of my favorites. It's from FEMA again, uh, Federal Emergency Management Association or ACT. Um, these are 12 ways to re to prepare both home and office. Again, sign up for these alerts and warnings. Very important. Start making yourself a plan. Look at your risk and your uh, places of business and what could happen there. Um, saving for a rainy day, always good to have cash available at the office and at home. Um, ATMs may not be working. Um, so, you know, having a few hundred dollars um, extra in case you need to book is a good idea. Practice these emergency drills like we mentioned. Practice them at, at the office. Practice them at home. So it is, you know it like the back of your hand. Um, and test them both at the office and at home with other uh, emergency people that we spoke about. Safeguard our documents, we just mentioned that. Yes, a safe is nice, uh, but again, I think cloud-based backup is one of the best. Um, plan with your neighbors, um, and these could be your work neighbors, these could be your office neighbors. What are you going to do? Where are we going to evacuate? Who's going to take care of the dog? Um, what are you doing to make your home site safer? Um, could be locks, could be um, this uh, uh, collapsible ladders, could be a lot of things. Um, know your routes. Where is everybody going to meet? Have a particular location. Um, uh, start assembling these, these go kits, if you want to call them, go bags. Um, and update the supplies, obviously. You know, uh, I don't need to have five-year-old um, emergency bars in there. Um, um, or your your uh, tape may may get a little soggy after a period of time, but I'm always updating those. Um, and I found I don't use anything with batteries. I uh, I have a crank flashlight and a crank um, emergency radio, so I I don't even need to do that. Um, getting involved in your community is so is so important. We'll talk about that um, in a moment here. Uh, next slide, actually. Um, is the um, Medical Reserve Corps that I'm actually a part of. It's a, it's a national network of volunteers, and they are organized locally, and they help improve the health and safety of the communities. This um, actually, uh, President Bush back in 2002 started this, but it really came into effect um, after 9-11 because so many people showed up to help, and um, they they – notice that we need uh, uh, some type of mechanism to better utilize these volunteers. There are over 900 units across the United States. There are over 2,000 volunteers. Um, I've been involved for a number uh, of years now, um, and it just gives me a good satisfaction in helping others. Um, but did you know that volunteering for something like this actually can affect your own health docs? Um, the research has been shown um, that a strong relationship between volunteering and health uh, lowers your mortality rate, uh, has you have a greater uh, functional ability, and lowered rates of depression. And you don't have to be medical to do something with um, um, Medical Reserve Corps. There are also non-medical uh, 
positions that can be done in safety, logistics, uh, lots of different things. I've been trained in health screening, emergency preparators, first aid, mental health, uh, disease outbreaks of which we mocked in Ebola um, and, and got involved with a, a local school and uh, actually had um, a scenario where we, we had um, vaccinations um, mock vaccinations given out, and we did this over a period of two or three hours. Um, we worked last year with the Vermont National Guard, who were the first to respond to 9-11, by the way, and um, the University of Vermont Medical Center and others, and we did a mock plane crash. Um, that was eye-opening. Uh, ambulance reserve were involved in all of this. But I've also been, t you know, trained with mental health and uh, even Narcon training. Um, so all of these have helped to get involved. Now, it doesn't have to be the Red, uh, the American, uh, uh, the Medical Reserve Corps. It could be Red Cross. But I found that the the uh, MRC is, is a great thing to get involved with. Um, so wrapping up here, we have a few things from KMC. We have a great hands-on lab that's going to be in Denver, October 20th and 21st. And the, the main core is on elements of reimbursement. And uh, patient collections, insurance billings, new patients, 12 hours, it's going to be hands-on training, not just uh, lecturing, uh, with Kathy and, and a bunch of our team uh, joining in. So really excited about that, uh, that hands-on lab, HOL, is coming back to Denver, again, October 20th and 21st. Um, right now, um, because you guys are um, CHUSA members and we work very well with them, um, we have our KMC library right now is uh, just $79 a month. Let me tell you, folks, this is the most extensive library of information I have seen for our profession. We get this updated constantly. It is incredible. I have, I, I have in, in over a year, I have not seen all of the library yet. That's how much information is in there. Everything on how to run your office, documentation, Medicare, Medicaid, on and on and on. It's, it's just fantastic. And for those of you that actually need to update your HIPAA, uh, new regulations came out in 2013, and also uh, OIG compliance training. We offer that also um, at 2.29 a month for those of you listening um, here. Um, so we have some uh, resources here that um, I we have these, and we have a couple others that I will make sure that you can get just in uh, case you are wanting any of that information um, on FEMA and emergency preparedness. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Fran. Um, if you have any questions, please go ahead and submit those now, um, and we will uh, get Dr. Fran to uh, answer those for you while we are live and in person. Now, if you have questions after the webinar, like I do on a regular basis, you can email info at kmcuniversity.com um, to, um, to submit those questions. They'll make sure that they're routed to Dr. Fran, um, and she'll get that information to you. All of these resources are, um, there's a handout in your follow-up email with a link to the webinar recording, you just click on it, it'll print off this list of um, resources um, so that you'll have that available. Um, let's Great see. stuff. All the work's been done for you. All the work's been done. Don't we love that? Because um, we always have too much to do and not enough time to get it all done. Um, if you need some more information about KMC University's hands-on lab, uh, make sure you reach out uh, to KMC University. Again, you can use that email, info at kmcuniversity.com. We are super excited to be attending that event. I'll be teaching with Kathy on Saturday morning, and I will tell you that this is probably one of the most difficult presentations that I have written because it is so hands-on. It is very little lecture and a whole lot of work so that when you leave this event, you're leaving with the resources 
that you need. So you're not having to go back to work and have a ton of work left to do um, in a to-do list or a three-ring binder that's sitting off to the side um, with stuff that you intend to do but just never get around to. You're going to get it done while you're at the hands-on lab. So um, definitely look into it. This is an awesome opportunity. Um, I've been going for seven years now, and I tell you I learn something every single time I attend. So Absolutely. Definitely check that out. Um, you can also read more about it at kmcuniversity.com forward slash hands-on lab. Um, does not look like we have any questions. Um, so just a reminder, we have uh, Dr. Todd Pickman, um, who's going to be with us next week, talking about um, having a successful home mobility program um, in your practice. The following week, we're going to have uh, David Baer. He's an international speaker and entrepreneur. Um, we're really excited that he's going to be on the webinar series because he actually gets paid like, you know, $50,000 to speak for an hour all across the world. Um, but he's going to be talking about getting your mindset right on how to radically grow your practice. Um, and so if you have not registered for those, um, especially David Bayer. That one's probably going to fill up really fast. So make sure you go to our website, coverhealthusa.com forward slash webinars. We have webinars posted all the way through November. By the first of next week, we should have the rest of the year up there. So you can go ahead and mark your calendars, register for these webinars, and get ready. Um, we are working on the 2019 webinar series. So if there's a particular speaker that you are interested in, if there is a particular topic that you want covered, Make sure you email me, Christy, at CoverHealthUSA.com, um, and let me know so we can get them on here. Um, before we close, we're just going to do a real quick survey um, of information. Let's see. If you could answer these quick questions really quick um, about KMC University, um, we would love it. Um, thank y'all again. You have to be on the lookout. That webinar is uh, email is going to go out to y'all in about 20 minutes. Um, and again, the recording will be available online because this is definitely something you should probably share with your team as you're developing your emergency preparedness plan for your practice. Um, so go ahead and um, Utilize this webinar recording as part of a staff meeting. It, again, it'll be available for a year. Dr. Fran, thank you so much for um, being on our webinar series today. Well, thank you. It was fun. It is fun. And I am tell you all, if you ever get the opportunity to see Dr. Fran live and in person, she sounds fun <laughs> on a webinar, but it is nothing compared to Dr. Fran live and in person. I know y'all hear me say this a lot about different speakers that we have on here, but I am telling you, their larger-than-life personalities that you get on these webinars is nothing compared to live and in person. And she has a whole lot of energy, a whole lot of information, and a whole lot of fun. So if you see Dr. Fran coming to a state association near you, please go be, be the first one to sit down on the front row um, for her class um, if you're interested. Um, and getting speakers for your conventions in the upcoming year, make sure you email um, Christy at CoverHealthUSA.com. Our speakers are booking up for 2019. Um, if you're interested in Dr. Fran, you can email me, and I'll afford it to KMC University, or you can reach out to them directly. Dr. Fran, I cannot wait to see you in two weeks and counting. Okay. All right, everyone. Y'all have an amazing rest of your day and a Fabulous week, and I will see y'all with Dr. Pickman next week. Bye-bye. Bye. Dr. Fran,